This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. I'm Mike Keith and excited to talk with someone who, when I was a young man starting to follow the NFL, was a player that we were always excited to see, a player that we looked up to. Billy White Shoes Johnson joins me on the OTP. Sir, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. It's good to be here and good to be seen these days. All right, so I have to ask this question. Do you ever wear anything other than white shoes? No, I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Early on, I might have, but after that second or third year, I don't think I have. But in your, like in your wardrobe, do you? No, do no, you, no. I always white shoes. When you're white shoes, Johnson, yes. you have to wear white shoes, right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, people look at you like you got two heads if I don't have on white shoes. And then they get to the point where, you know, sometimes you can have a little bit of blue in the back of the shoe. That's not an all white shoe. So, man, I can't win. But yeah, it's only white shoes. So how did you become White Shoes Johnson? I was the president of the Pat Boone Club. We were white uh, bucks. I'm lying. Don't I was going to say, you got to be kidding me. I know about the white <laughs> bucks with Pat Boone, Billy. No. No, that's good. No. <laughs> very, very well done. I started uh, just to be different in uh, high school because that, at that time, everybody was wearing black shoes and it's kind of redundant to me, and I just want to do a little flash. So we were sitting on our front porch, I guess, one day, and a good friend of ours came up to me while I was out there. I'm young and impressionable. He asked me, if you think you're so good, why don't you wear uh, uh, white shoes like Joe Willie Namath? Well, because he was the guy. He was the guy who He wore them. those white spot belts. Exactly. That were so sweet. Yeah, they were nice. And see, what I did when I got my shoes finally I had kangaroo. You remember the kangaroo sure. leather, which is a little bit of a step up from spot built. But uh, uh, we were able to get some, and I took them to a nice little uh, cobbler who uh, dyed those shoes. I mean, he stripped the, the uh, shoe, and then he dyed, put dye on it, and he taught me how to do it. So my senior year, that was my junior year, my senior year, he did two pairs, and I did one pair. But he, uh, And he did that, and so what happened, um, we went to a game, uh, and we played the best defense in our county. And I had a good game, and uh, it was a homecoming game. So they says, Blazing Billy White Shoes, uh, something, something, the crowd, on Mother's, on, on the Parents' Day, which was a big headline. And I thought it was hokey at that time, oh, White Shoes, uh and ever since then, and ever since that game that I had that good game, and uh, they've been calling me white shoes. Now, my coach didn't, didn't, didn't care too much for it at first. Uh, because it was too showy. Too showy, yeah. And he's the kind of guy, no frills, no thrills. Right. But when I went to training camp, and I wore them one day, and he came after a, a second, a third or fourth day, uh, two days, and we were going to have a scrimmage, he said, uh, what's up with the shoes? And, for no better reason, I said, and they, they make me run faster. <laughs> and he didn't say a word. He just said, so, okay, he nodded his head. So we had a scrimmage, and I had a good game. He never said another word about the shoes. And I'm so thankful that he allowed me to wear them because, and you feel good about it because, sure. you know, if you look good, you feel good, that old saying is true. I mean, even in high school, I knew that. I said, man, it just give me a little bit more confidence. It's just not a doldrum zone. It was something that uh, was different. And you had to play because you're seen. You're the guy out there who's showing who's wearing white shoes. And of course, they're going to want to uh, stop the marked man, you know, a guy who they might think might be a hot dog. So it, it made you play harder, train harder, so you wouldn't be embarrassed. It took guts. Yeah. In the late 60s and early yeah. 70s, that was not done. Yeah. Well, you had to have a little bit of talent, I oh. guess, to do that. And I and our team was talented to the point. We didn't win no state championship, but we played well. But you go to, to Widener College, yeah. which is now Widener University. Correct. And it had been a military school 
before you got there. So how did how were you able to keep wearing the white shoes there? PM said, well, at that time they started being a little, they relinquished that uh, strict <laughs> dressing command. But at that time, Coach Bill Manlove, which changed the whole history of PMC Widener, he was there and he didn't mind. <clears throat> And uh, it was just as long as you could play and, and show toughness. That's that's all that mattered. And, you know, you uh, could follow the rules. Because, uh, like I said, I started when it was PMC. And uh, I graduated when it was Widener. So on my diploma, it has PMC Widener, and uh, which is good. Because Coach Manlove made all the difference for me in the world. I was kind of a braggadocia, you know, take challenges, a little cocky. I wasn't I'm never arrogant, but just I like taking challenges. And uh, he was able to, he's such a good person. He was like my dad. He talks something, you do something wrong, and you know you want to hear from him. You say, oh, shoot, I disappointed coach. That's for me. He was that kind of coach for me. And he, and we're still good, best of friends now. And I talk to he and uh, Mrs. Man Love, Edna, that uh, we stay in touch. But he was that kind of coach, was really good for me. He, to me, he exa he's exemplified what it was like to be a coach. Now, he could be tough on you, but he was fair. And he had a lot of respect uh, from a lot of, not only me, but from a lot of guys on the team. And he was just like that father, uh, father figure. And I had a strong father, so, <laughs> but, he, but I can only imagine if I did something wrong with him, you know, it'd be a, he handled it a different way. Coach Manlove was a little bit more mild mannered, but no, he was. I had so much uh, the utmost respect for him. The Oilers drafted you in the fifteenth round in nineteen seventy four. Do you know the story of how they found you? Do you were you, were you made aware of that later on in life? I, I think it was Bruce Kebrick who was on a scouting trip. He was up near Temple and. If I'm not mistaken, he said, well, let me go up and see this guy. Because our team, our offensive line was pretty good at that time. I mean, you, I think they could put anybody behind that line, and they would have done well. And uh, he heard about me, came out, and he, I guess they ran me through the 40 and came out on the field to see me uh, do some things on the field. And he said, hey, I like this guy. Now, that's what was told to me, so I'm not sure, but it was because of Bruce Kebrick that I am an oiler. Well, I mean, let's face it, Widener is more famous for being the school that director Cecil B. DeMille Cecil B. DeMille, attended. Yes. So, and Humphrey Bogart, don't forget well, that. There are a lot of politicians <laughs> yes. and lawyers and big time people have gone there, but to, cadets. Fi to find you in the 15th round and then to bring you in and for you to make the team, how does a 15th round pick make a football team? Oh, I think I was blessed. I was truly blessed. Um, by God, because uh, uh, you're a 15th round draft choice. You're a small guy from a small school. Uh, you know, it was just uh, the timing was right. And that timing was from uh, the Lord himself. So I, I take no uh, credits for making it other than being in the right place at the right time and the Lord uh, put, putting me there. And punt returning and kick returning, that was the way in. That was a way in. I just wanted to get a chance to get the ball any way I could to prove that I could play with the guys who were, let's face, went to bigger schools, uh, had more uh, media attention than myself, but I can play just as good as them if given the opportunity. And lo and behold, I, I was given that opportunity. Where did the dance come from and when did it first oh, happen oh, now, i know oh, i know yeah. the dance itself was the funky chicken yeah 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 but where did it come from in your mind to do that and where did you first do it i first did it i was you know at that time college we were playing a rival team of ours and they were a little hokey they got a little above themselves you know and me being always in the entertainment field at that time i would be hosting nightclub acts and stuff like that. So I had really? a, yeah, I had a chance to host a Rufus Thomas who made the funky Funky the, Chicken yeah, famous. Yeah. Who made the hey, do the funky chicken. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you another lie. So <laughs> Oh you did see <laughs> no, I shouldn't do that. I promise no more. No more storytelling. But I did know Rufus you, Thomas yeah, you know was, that, so I didn't know that you, was true. You know and that, that could have happened. Yeah yeah you're right. It, 
Yeah, that's what happened in the court of law. You it told it me could have that happened. And I would have never doubted you. No, you're right because it's almost like the truth, uh -huh. you know. But no, but what happened? We were, this is true. We were playing a rival ball club of ours, and they said some things which was bulletin board material, and we were sitting in the, I think, in the locker room joking and. You know how guys are. You push one, everybody they're pushing the envelope. And I said, I tell you what, if I were to score, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dance. And then I did something. And he said, man, you ain't going to do it. I said, man, I am. I really, I had, I had no real intentions of doing it. But when I scored, I had to do something because, you know, you can, can't live it down. Oh, yeah. You would have been a plug if you had done it at that time and said you're going to do something, didn't do it. So uh, I, I scored a couple of times. I danced a couple of times. And I kept my end of the bargain. That's how I looked at it. <laughs> but it just so happened because we had a lot of fun with it. We weren't trying to be uh, derogatory in any way, trying to rub their noses in it. We were just having fun. It was part of what we did. And you mentioned your coach would let you be you. He would let me be, and that's what I really liked. That's what I really liked. He didn't say anything. There's one time, though, he did say, I, I was really upset at that we were playing the team. I'm not going to mention their names. And... Um, they were playing a little dirty because they wanted to get me, you know. And, and I understand you're a marked man, but uh, I got a little upset, so I, I broke into the open field and I sat down and I started slowing down, and I pointed at the guys, uh -oh. which is hot doggish. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm really not that player. Uh, and he said, "Why would you do that? Not in the over uh, animated voice or anything like that." He said, "That's not you." He says. You know, don't do that. He says, that's how you get hurt. You set yourself up to get hurt. He said, but you're a better person. Better person than that be above that. And I felt about this big. I felt about one inch tall because he was telling the truth and I knew better, but I just wanted to get my point of revenge uh, after what they did to me, you know, trying to poke me in the eye and, you know, just playing a little bit dirty. And they normally wouldn't, but after that, no problems. Did you know you were going to do that when you got in the end zone when you were with the Oilers, or did it just happen? It just ha I promise you, it just happened. Because it happened, and I uh, uh, beat the Steelers. That's, that's the year they went and won the Super Bowl, 74. We had beat the Steelers. I had scored on the end around. And uh, Mike Wagner was the last guy I had to run past. And I Number 23? There. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I went in there, and I automatically did it. And I said, oh, shucks. I said, here I am up here on a big stage in the professional ranks, and I'm being a hot dog. But I wasn't. I went over and I asked him about that. He said, that's what it takes. I'd like to see more of it. I wasn't going to go see Sid Gilman at that time. <laughs> he was a head coach. He probably could care less because I got in the end zone. And Bum just said, hey, that's what it takes. So be it, you know. And, it, and that's what happened. I really didn't. And then a couple other times I said, I'm not going to dance again. And it just happened. Then later on, they said, man, we like that dance. We want to see you do it more. And so anytime I would score after that, I would, I would dance. I used to get phone calls on the road. Hopefully uh, our team wins, but we want to see you do the dance. I mean, I don't know how they got my number at the hotel to call or say leave a message. Or, it was fun. And it was fun. It, I, I just, you know, in the NFL, it was fun. I never, ever... Uh, try to humiliate another opponent. They can't say that I did. You look at any tape, I always went to the end zone, uh, corner of the end zone to dance. When did you know that it was something very different and that people really loved it? Wow, that's probably about the third time I did it. <laughs> and they said, man, we want to see that dance today, next game. I said, wow, maybe something is good. And it seems as though, you know, you get pumped up more and you worked harder. Because you're an entertainer. I mean, we are entertainment, but I just, it was just fun. I mean, I did it in college all that time. And it, seeming, it seemed at that time when I was in college that people wanted to come to the game to see what he would do next. Uh, that's what it was. But I, you know, like I say, it was all part of uh, getting our guys pumped up because they wanted to see it. They had their hand in allow me to be successful to get into the end zone, be it a punt return, a kickoff return, a, a pass or, or end around, or anything from scrimmage, they knew they had a hand in it. And that was a celebration not only for me, but for the team. More of the conversation with Billy White Shoes Johnson on the OTP continues. But first, we have to remind you, it's always game on with Duncan. So grab a coffee and kick off the action 
Whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home, Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual, because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. But those Oilers teams you were on too, I mean, Bum Phillips was a character. Yeah. How he dressed and everything. Yeah. There were other characters on the team. <laughs> Earl Campbell certainly yeah. became a, a mythical figure. And so you were part of something, Love You Blue, we're the Houston Oilers, all of the things that were with it, challenging the Steelers for the first time yes. in that era. Um, it was a thing, and you were a part of that thing that NFL films would seemingly show every single week. I think it's because it was an oddity at that time. When Bum and this cowboy hat, and the players on no-name defense at that time, when you look at I mean, other than Curly, who else would you say? Maybe Elvin Bethay, because he'd been there all those years. Then we got Robert Brazil on the defense. And Teddy well, he's Washington. Dr. Doom. Dr. Doom. Mean, Doom. Yeah, Dr. Doom. You got Dr. Doom. Yeah, and yeah. And then you had uh, 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 Kenny Burrow's double O. You double know, o. who double Kenny O? Burrow. Absolutely. Uh, I remember John Masender talking about that. So we had the big names like that. But, you know, who would have said, yeah, that's good down there. But when we got on the national stage and played the Steelers tough, and, uh, of course, they beat us twice to get to the Super Bowl. <laughs> but it was fun. And see, and you can tell uh, a lot of draft choices. Um, I don't shouldn't say draft choices. A lot of free agents made that team, made it up uh, at that time. To, to make it what it was. So when you're a hardworking guy and we're all after the same thing, you know, some of us didn't get a chance to, uh, rightfully so, but we got, a, we got that second chance and we wanted to make, do, uh, make well with it. So that's why we were so close, I think. And, and we enjoyed each other. We enjoyed being around each other, and especially uh, when the, they started, the city started getting behind us, boy. And so we had, and then we got her off, woo. Wow. <laughs> we were off and running for sure then. Billy White Shoes Johnson, the white shoes and the end zone dance may have made you famous, but the fact of the matter is 1975 is one of the greatest years for a returner in NFL history. You're considered the greatest punt returner in NFL history. The 75th anniversary team named you as their punt returner. The 100th anniversary team in 2018 named you as the punt returner. So there was quite a bit of substance behind what you did more so than just the flash. And as your career went on, especially when you went to Atlanta later, you got a chance more as a receiver. True. Um, I, I mean, your career was incredibly accomplished outside of just the fun part of it. And that has to be special in your heart, too. It is. I, I found a coach down there who, who knew I could play inside. He um, enhanced my career, the second part of my career with the Falcons. But I'll say this, it's um, uh, the guys along the way that made it possible for me. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of them guys uh, uh, made it happen for me. You know, you look at, you, you got your names on defense. And our starting defense would be out there on punt returns, you know. Then you got your kickoff returns. Some of our offensive linemen be out there, starting offensive linemen to be out there. So it, it, it was gratifying to see these guys believed in me to, you know, to do the best I could do. And I believed in them. You look at, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Eddie Fisher, Andy Doris, uh, Ronnie Coleman, C.L. Whittington, Al Johnson. Um, these guys who uh, who 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 made it happen for me, offensively and defensively. And uh, they contributed as much to my success as I did. And that's, I think that's, that's why. Because we all wanted, we were all on the same page. Let's get into the end zone. Let's, let's win. And then with Bum, his style of coaching only amplified it more so. Well, because him coming from the Bear Bryant tree. Yes. He believed in special teams dramatically. He he was from that school that you can change field position. It sounds much like Mike Vrabel right now. Yeah. Change field position. You start every possession with a first down. You can, you can pick up a score. All of those sorts of things factoring in. And then when you have a guy, and we saw it with Chris Johnson in 2009. We saw it uh, with 
Derrick Henry in 2020. Ooh, yeah. When the team starts to believe the person with the ball can hit a home run, they try harder. Yeah, and that's true. And that's true. And me knowing that I'm going to have the ball in my hand, they're expecting what I'm doing. So I got to make sure I produce for them because they made some blocks. I mean, you see some, on several, um, I guess, films of us returning the ball. Uh, Robert Brazil making two blocks. C.L. Whittington, Ronnie Coleman making two or three blocks. I'll, I'll never forget about three weeks back to back. Ronnie, CL, to get somebody else. They had knocked guys out of the game on, on special teams, and they did it fairly. They could have probably gotten away with it today by today's standards of hitting people. But the angles that they were taking and the way that they were protecting me, golly day. So I had to, I had to produce because those guys put it on the line like that for me in the kickoff returns. Uh, gee whiz, it's the same thing. I mean, we had starting guys out there on the – special teams, and it's special. Uh, that's why I liked about Bum. Bum never gave me no directions of, okay, we've got to return right, but you go with what you see. Always, hey, handle the ball. You know, you're never supposed to handle the ball inside the 10 yard line. I did that on several occasions, not knowing where I was at because he said, just get it. If you feel you can get it, go with it. What makes a great punt returner? Great um, judgment and, and, and right away with field presence of catching the ball, uh, knowing where you are on the field, getting there quick, setting up like a baseball player, you know, as if he's getting ready to throw the ball. But once you get it, just let your in instincts take over. You know where you're supposed to go, what you're supposed but you don't know. You just got to go with the flow of, of, you know, that which is intrinsic to, to happen. And if you buy, you do that, shoot, that's what it is. And I would say, I'll, I'll try and sum up and saying, sit, you know, sit up quick, take the first step to freeze them, then go with what you know. Is Devin Hester the greatest overall returner of all time? Wow. He's one of the biggest I've seen. <laughs> Physically, he He's is. He's a good-sized guy. Oh, yeah. I say, say, no wonder it's tough to – I say, he, he's smart. He knows he got speed, and, and he can do it. But you've got guys like Gail Sayers and, and, you know, Rick Upchurch. And I tell you, in our conference, you had Greg Pruitt. There, there, there's a lot to be said about that. He – uh, he, he's got some contention there, put well, it that way. Well, because the guys you're talking about weren't specialists. No. Rick Upchurch played wide receiver. Greg Pruitt was a great running back. Gail Sayers, Sayers was Gail Sayers. Yeah, I mean, yeah. come on. And you got Eminem Tunnell. Go back right. to Eminem Tunnell. Yes. I mean, so who's to say? I mean, just to be mentioned in that company, I feel good because all those guys were, they made a difference in the game. But they're not the greatest punt returner on the 75th anniversary or the 100th anniversary well, team. People see it differently. <laughs> <laughs> you, go, you ain't trapping me. No, I'm not, tra yeah, I'm not yeah. trapping you. I'm bragging on you because, oh, yeah. I mean, to think about the people who voted on that and the amount of football that's been played and the way the kicking game has evolved in different ways, uh, I mean, wow. I mean, to, to be called not just the first time around, you know, 25 years in, in 1993, but in 2018 to be called again, that's phenomenal. Well, I, is that what you're most proud of? Boy, I don't As know. As a football player? Gosh. Probably, but there's a lot of other games that I think, a lot of other things. You know, like when you talk about punt returns, you're really talking, about, especially in this era after me, you look at Devin Heston, you look at Deion Sanders and a couple of guys who came behind them, they're good. But I think most of you, you'll see that uh, the other, you know, like Dion, he played a position. Sure did. Most of us played a position, really, and we act and contributed, contributed in an act in a, in a big way. Uh, then you have some who just can't get on the field. All they can do is punt and kick off return, which is no slap in their face to me. I mean, if you can catch punts and not think about it and get it done, you, you where you're supposed to be. Uh, and that's why I say I hope they never take the return game out of, out of the league altogether. Because that's the exciting part of the football game to me, the change of position. And when you look at guys like that, I, like I said, I feel happy to be mentioned like that and to, to be selected. But uh, there, 
there's a lot more out there. But you think about the, the fabric of the NFL and everybody knows who you are because of your nickname. You, the story of the end zone dance, which is part of the celebration, which makes the NFL the number one sport in America because it's not just a game, it's a show. And people love following every part of the show and the celebration is fun. <laughs> when I started playing football, we did the Billy White Shoes Johnson dance. <laughs> dating me. Well, but uh, dating <laughs> yeah. me. But the, but the whole thing was, they can't tell the story of this league without you. And I, I mean, that's, I mean, and you've done a lot more. I mean, you were in the league 15 years. You had to go to Canada to work your way back from an injury and to show that you could still do it. And then you, you were with the Falcons for 15 years doing uh, their director of player development. And I mean, you've had a remarkable career in and outside of football, but I mean, this has got to be for a guy who played at Widener and it, it's got to be a little mind numbing, right? It, it, it is. I overwhelmed when, when <laughs> it is overwhelming to a point uh, when Amy, uh, they gave me the news that they were going to put me to the ring of honor. Boy, I mean, I was speechless and overwhelmed because that takes a lot for a team to sit down there and decide of who would go into the ring of honor. And I'm looking at the guys that I'm following, Earl Campbell, Robert Brazil, uh, Alvin Bethay, Frank Wycheck, and all these guys. It's, it, that's tall, you know, you're, you're in big company, big time company. Uh, and you know, I just felt blessed and fortunate that I came along when I came along and played for the right people. Uh, and I just, I just have been so fortunate. It's been a great walk for me, a great run. And I have no regrets. I do it again. Um, it, it just, like I say, I, I, you know, from the very beginning, uh, when I'm called Ellen Bethay to honor the strike at that time, <laughs> and he asked me what round was I drafted in the 15th, he said, no, come on in. Ever since I called him that day, I, God had his hand on me saying, okay, we're going to, because I don't want, they want to be a strike breaker or a scab. And Elvin just said, hey, I guess he thought I wasn't going to make the team being a 15th round draft choice. So he said, yeah, come on in. And then when he met me, I'll never, never forget, oh, you're the little pissant who called me about, <laughs> <laughs> about coming, to, coming to camp. He says, man, if I know how big you are, I would have told you no. <laughs> Don't come at all. But it was so funny. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you made things worked out for you. But it's... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess uh, this this moment of being uh, inducted to the Ring of Honor is, is something I never thought about. And I never found it in any way. And Amy Adams Strzok made it happen because she's been determined to put the whole family together. Yeah. And for those of us here, it's been a beautiful thing to get to experience all of it, to see all of this together in this way. and. Like yes. I said, I've, I've known who you were for 50 years. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> and so the excitement of getting a chance to meet you and getting a chance to see this happen for you. And I think people of my age and even younger who know your story, they, they knew immediately when Amy said she wanted to do this, like, absolutely. He's not already in. <laughs> and so it's, it's, you're the 18th member and it's wonderful. Well, thank you. And I, I just, I'm glad. And first class all the way first class all the way. So it's, uh, like I said, it's kind of overwhelming at that time. I mean, for me, it is. Billy White Shoes Johnson, thank you so much for joining me on the OTP. Reminder that SeatGeek is the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or to any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. For the newest member of the Oilers, Titans, Ring of Honor, Billy White Shoes Johnson, I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for joining us for the O-Team.